Welcome to our discussion, what is next now that we have a Brexit deal. A look ahead on EU-UK relations with the EU's Brexit negotiator, Stefan de Rink. This event is brought to you by the European American Chamber of Commerce, where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. My name is Yvonne Bendinger Rothschild. I'm the executive director of the EACC in New York, and I will be your host um, for the, today's event. We have today the honor of welcoming Stefan de Rink. He's um, the senior advisor to the chief negotiator for Brexit at the EU Commission and John Sinclair Foley, the US editor of Reuters Breaking News and an old friend of the EACC who will be moderating the discussion and who will be getting us answers to the questions like what the future holds for EU UK trade and um, what we got, both sides, and um, who, um, what we didn't achieve with the agreement, um, who got the better deal, um, and did we, the EU, get everything that we wanted? Um, and um, much a mystery to me, why we haven't um, discussed financial services and spent so much time on discussing fish and mollusks. But um, John, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, Yvonne. Thanks everyone for joining us and thank you, Stefan, for being with us today. Um, it's been a busy four years for you, but particularly a busy year. So I, I remember like, at the beginning of 2020, you said that one of the big challenges was going to be time. Um, you didn't have that much time to draw up the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. And it turned out, obviously, that there were other challenges that we didn't at that time know about, like COVID, um, like various curveballs from the UK side, which at one point seemed like it was going to rip up an important piece of the framework. But you got it done by the year end um, in the nick of time. Um, we're now in the next phase. Tell me what, to, to kick us off, what is what is currently your priority? What are you engaged in now that that cooperation agreement has been, uh, in, in theory, slightly provisionally, provisionally, I think, ratified? Yes, sir. Good, good afternoon from Brussels. Good morning, John. Uh, and thank you also Yvonne and Femke for organizing. Uh, on our minds now and on our plate is the, the provisional application of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which is going on right now. Yesterday, the European Commission made a proposal um, for a Council decision to, to extend that, at least for the Council to allow us to go to the Partnership Council to extend that period of provisional application. Uh, we continue working with the structures on the Council side, on the Member State side, and on the European Parliament side that we had set up during the Brexit negotiations, which are which are now finished. So there's a bit more time there for the democratic scrutiny and uh, in all the languages of, of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. And more substantively, we are working on setting up the whole governance structure, the Partnership Council. Uh, Vice President Sefcovic, who is the Slovak member of the European Commission, has been appointed as the EU representative there. We um, need to see who from the UK side will be in that partnership council and they can also take that decision to extend possibly provisional application. We're working on level playing fields. We need to implement a number of issues there. So we're reflecting with various departments of the commission, DG Trade, DG Competition, on um, these rebalancing measures, how to how to play that, how, how to organize that on the side of, of the EU, also discussing with member states. And then, of course, there is the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's applicable, well, it's entered into force, let's say, on the ground since five, six weeks. So it's very new for everyone to get acquainted and to get adjusted to this protocol. We had prepared with the UK authorities in 2020. Not everything is ready yet. And Maro Sefcovic, our vice president, is actually on the train to London as we speak to, uh, to discuss a number of issues there with Michael Gove, his counterpart on, on the protocol. It's important that the protocol and all its provisions are fully implemented uh, as quickly as possible so that we can give stability and certainty also to, to the economy in Northern Ireland. So when, when we talk about provisional, the provisional status of the agreement as it is at the moment, and that deadline, as you say, is for, for officially ratifying it, it is originally I think it was going to be Feb, end of February, right? And obviously Correct. that's moved for various reasons. Just to be clear, does that mean that there is still scope for the agreement to change? No, no, that's, um, there is no scope for the agreement to change. The agreement needs to be ratified, first of all, on our side, on the EU side, and then it needs to be implemented. Uh, and I see where the question comes from, because a number of stakeholders, especially in the UK economy, professions or specific sectors in food and drink or manufacturing or services are discovering or are now experiencing what they 
new was coming, uh, adjusting to the new normal, so to say. Uh, it's extra red tape, extra costs. For some, it means that certain business models will have to change, certain supply chains will have to change, not to make them more economically rational, because that's not what leaving the single market and the customs union is about, obviously, on the UK side. It's to, it's basically an extra cost for business. And so, but the pressure then, of course, from these businesses to renegotiate certain issues is there, but we are not going to respond to that. This is the agreement and it must now be implemented. So, so let's talk a bit about those, some of the, what people are causing, calling teething problems. This, like this phrase teething problems is becoming a bit of a kind of cliche, but what it looks like in practice, it seems, is is a quite a quite an alarming reduction in trade volumes between the UK and the EU. I think that the the high speed data that we've seen shows that volumes are down around a quarter year on year. Freight prices from France to the UK are up fifty percent in January year on year. Um, do you to what extent is this teething problems, and to what extent is this the new reality? Because you're you're saying that you know part of this is this is this deal was not about economic rationality. This is changing the terms of trade. We have no tariffs, but we certainly have a lot of non-tariff barriers still. How much of the, the shift is just the way things now are? Well, I think some of it can indeed be teething problems in the sense that businesses will, will have to get used to some extra procedures and, uh, and extra checks uh, in terms of export health certificates just to stick to the agricultural and food and drink industry, for instance. Um, adjusting to rules of origin. I mean, distribution hubs in the UK that were distributing single market goods or union goods to other parts of the EU need to consider now the regulatory framework is there. Does it still make sense to continue that? Do they adjust? Do they change their business model? Um, that's for them, of course, these businesses uh, to consider. But it's not just teething problems. I mean, of course, some are teething problems because you need to get too used to, to new procedures. And if you're a small company, well, either you do the paperwork yourself or you find a con consultant in the broad sense of the term, a customs logistics expert that helps you, or you hook up with a bigger company for exports, or you, or you basically abandon uh, certain export markets. Um, that, that's really decisions only companies can take. But that's not a teething problem. It's basically, it's, a, it's, it's, it's adjusting to a new situation, which is not, uh, as, as you say, not the most economically rational, because today the European Commission issued numbers on lost output and it's a hit for both sides for the EU as well as for the UK uh, in terms of lost output that you can that you can expect from this adjustment over the next two years. I mean the challenge for the UK of course will be to develop a new agenda now a new global Britain agenda to see where the, the opportunities are. We have never seen those opportunities on the EU side from Brexit but that's really a matter for the UK now. What we have though constructed in this trade and cooperation agreement is a system of level playing field whereby the UK will need to make a choice between either it significantly diverges from uh, standards we have agreed to, which we hope not, because then we get into a rebalancing measures and level playing field remedial measures, which is something we all would like to avoid. Because the important thing also now is even though the new situation is not economically as optimal as before, as optimal as membership, it's important that we create a positive cooperation agenda now with the UK going forward and that we're not going to go and get into a game of using level playing field remedial rebalancing measures against each other. That would be an undesirable situation. It's possible that it will happen, but let's hope it doesn't and everybody agree, sticks to the open and fair competition standards we agreed. Do you feel like you have got a positive cooperating environment right now? Well, it needs, uh, that's maybe part of the teething problems that we need to create that uh, fully positive uh, cooperative environment. Uh, obviously, we had our issues on the Northern Irish Irish protocol, uh, but we also had broader issues on the recognition of the, the London delegation of the EU there in terms of its diplomatic status, a number of um, statements that were also made. Uh, so we, we need to get beyond this. And I think we will and we can to create a constructive uh, atmosphere and, and a constructive spirit of cooperation be between the between the UK and the EU. So just before, and I, I'd like to zoom in on some of those uh, the issues that you just mentioned, but on, on, the, on these teething problems, we're obviously still in the middle of a, a very severe pandemic, um, and that is going to go on for several more months. And that seems to me there's a risk that that is masking some of the actual real effect of this, because movement of many things people for example is not what it would be in normal times so we haven't we're, we're starting to see people discover that they can't take their 
assistance animals as easily as they could between Scotland and Northern Ireland, or that musicians can't travel um, to perform in the European mainland as easily as they could. But presumably, as the pandemic eases, we're going to see a, a, a lot more of these, um, these teething problems at a time when we were hoping the teething problems were going to be disappearing, because you know a lot of people had assumed that by summer, a lot of the problems we're seeing now will go away. I guess what I'm saying is, is it possible that when the pandemic eases, we'll see a whole new set of teething problems come in? No, the adjustment is happening now. I see what you're saying, because indeed the pandemic is, of course, the, the most important crisis that we have to deal with from the health as well as the economic perspective and we'll get through this these are difficult times both for the eu the uk the united states but okay we uh, as you rightly say there is a there is a perspective that at the end of the tunnel to get through through this and go back to some kind of normal situation in the economy and, and social life but for sure in terms of the opportunities of the uk economy to trade with with the european union countries uh, those will be marked characterized by friction that did not exist until the end of 2020 when we had these discussions in June, all this is water under the bridge now, but at least important to mention, we had these discussions in June. We said, do you really want to do that adjustment in the midst of a pandemic? Because by that time, January, we said, we will be in the midst of a pandemic. Why don't we extend the transition period, the economic status quo period? The UK did not want that, and that's its choice. And so we all have to have to live with that and adjust to that. My hunch on this and my feeling on this, and I've said this all along the, during the negotiations, is that Brexit, and the impact, the negative impact of leaving the single market and the customs union and the EU is not something you will see on one specific day. It's something that is spread out over years in terms of investment decisions of global firms. We'll maybe come to financial services later, but what, what do global banks, Japanese, US banks, how do, they, how do they see that? How does the car manufacturing industry see future investments and where? Uh, I think the, the, the actual impact of Brexit is a loss of output, as I said earlier, is what the Commission again said today. Uh, but this will be spread out, of course, over time. So um, just to, to, to talk about Northern Ireland for a bit. No, so Northern Ireland, the deal relating to Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is, you know, with less than equivalent to less than 1% of the EU population, I think. But it was structured very carefully because of the history of violence and sectarianism in that region. And, and, and you came to this deal that basically amounted to there being no customs border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, so already Britain is asking to renegotiate that. Uh, and there is a meeting today between Michael Gove, senior UK minister, and um, Maros Cevcevic, um, the commission vice president. Is it possible to renegotiate that deal and it, at this stage? And, and if not, isn't it, doesn't, isn't it looking like the relationship has already broken down? Well, we all have, and I think we all know in the UK and the EU and the UK government that we have a, a serious responsibility there because you're right to refer to the recent history of Northern Ireland and, and the Good Friday Agreement, of course, which, which is part of a peace process. Um, but also you know, the Biden administration no, knows very well, of course, and the United States know very well for having, uh, under the Clinton administration, played a very important role in bringing that about. Uh, and it creates unique set of circumstances in Northern Ireland. And in your question, you said, well, it's about avoiding the hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. And I think that is the, the element we need to focus on. And the UK government is, is and, and us, we are both very committed to that. And that's the good news in a way in, in all of this. And in, also during the negotiations that we always try to find mechanisms to keep that border open and avoid a hard border there. Now the protocol, is a carefully constructed compromise. Um, and I think that's often underestimated in the UK debate, how the EU went to great lengths there to compromise, to indeed keep that border between Northern Ireland and Ireland open. And that inevitably, in terms of the integrity of the single market and our customs union, meant a number of mechanisms that need to be put in place now. And the UK, even though it started a bit late in 2020, has worked very well and constructively with us to, to put these mechanisms in place. Um, so let's not get fixated on the last three, four weeks and all the unfortunate events also that happened on our side in, in terms of a mis mistake that was made, um, the transparency on, on vaccine exports, and keep our eye on, on, on the agreed provisions of the protocol. 
And yeah. I also take comfort in the fact that Michael Gove and, and, and Vice President Sefcovic in their joint statement last week both committed to the full implementation of the protocol and, and its agreed provisions. They, so there are a number of teething problems that need to be sorted out. We have given some grace periods there uh, to the application of the protocol and we need to discuss uh, how that is going. These grace periods are subject to very strict conditions. One is the alignment of the UK to EU rules for the issues that are covered by those grace periods. Uh, there are a number of labeling requirements and other issues that we need to reflect that you, that you need to reflect on and that we need to see happen as well in terms of the, the conditions of those grace periods, which are not fully fulfilled today. But I think we all need to recognize, and I think we do, that the protocol is the solution for reconciling Brexit, the Good Friday Agreement, keeping the border in between Northern Ireland and Ireland uh, open. So, so on the, uh, you talked about the, the mistake. Um, and just to recap for people who, if there is anyone who wasn't following this, which I doubt, but uh, but the, this was this this mistake was the idea that vaccines would be in some way prevented from crossing the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, which would effectively create something a bit like a a, a trade barrier between those two parts of the Republic of Ireland and the Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland. But just just on that, when I know the the Commission and um, President, uh, you know, President von der Leyen said um, mistakes were made. Who actually made the mistake? And what's going to happen to make sure? How do you make sure that that person or the, you know, the Commission doesn't make that mistake again? Well, the European Commission made the mistake. That, that's very clear, and the President was clear about that yesterday. I mean, the, the thing I would stress is that that mistake was very quickly corrected. Uh, before that regulation became law, basically. So the situation now is clear. There is no such thing uh, as the, the protocol applies and the trans transparency mechanism for exporting vaccines apply. Uh, and so that's and that's the situation today. So because so, and this comes down to this question of Article 16 of the protocol, right, which is the bit that allows either side to they can trigger it if they perceive there to be serious economic, social or environmental difficulties that have arisen um, between or surrounding the Northern Ireland area. Um, I, I, my sense is that when you create a, a, a provision like that, an article like that, the idea is that you'll never use it. It's there, it's there to give comfort, but you don't want people to trigger it. Um, but already, and we're only six weeks in, the Commission has triggered it, admittedly only for a brief period. Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, is now threatening to potentially trigger it. Um, if he feels that he ends up with a border between the Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland, which of course was actually the whole point of the deal was that there would be a border of some sort between Britain and Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But have you made, in your negotiations, have you actually inadvertently created something that is just far too easy to invoke? Because if we've already had two threats to use it in six weeks, where are we gonna be you know, when the teething problems really get bad? Yes, well, it wasn't invoked. That's on our side. Let, let's be clear about that. But there was indeed a, a mistake in considering to invoke that in, a, in the draft regulation. And as you say in your question, it is indeed a very, very last resort kind of mechanism uh, for unexpected societal, economic difficulties, unforeseen issues. So it is not that this is a clause that one can use because the agreed provisions cannot be fully implemented, for instance. It's not a clause that one can use because there is time needed to uh, adjust supply chains or distribution chains. Um, some distribution chains in Northern Ireland have actually remarkably well adapted, some have not. And so we need to keep the broader perspective here. We are in week five or so of the application of this protocol. That there are certain implementation problems, no one is surprised by that, I would say. The question is how do we tackle them now? But implementation problems can be solved with pragmatic solutions. Uh, with a number of issues that uh, Vice President Shevkovic set out in his letter to, to Michael Gove yesterday. Uh, the access of the EU Commission to the IT system of HMRC, which does the control, uh, customs controls uh, that needs to be done for trade from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. The border control post for checks on live animals or, or animal derived products. They have started to operate, uh, so they're still number of issues needs to be sorted out, but they're operating. Uh, so the protocol is starting to be applied, or is, does, does apply, obviously. There are a couple of implementation problems, but they can be, they can be sorted out with intelligent and, and pragmatic solutions. And we're certainly willing to, to work on that, but not to reopen what is the solution to, and, and, and a 
difficult solution to negotiate. So, so if I understand where we are at the moment, though, we've got the UK side is saying you tried to create a border, even momentarily, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and therefore we're going to ask you to renegotiate all, lots of aspects of this deal that don't necessarily pertain directly to that situation. On the other side, um, the, the European side is now saying, but you, you, Britain, haven't even done the things that you were supposed to be doing by now. I think the letter from Chesterbridge said that non-compliant packages were just basically sailing through without, without checks. So already you've got a situation where uh, you, you talk about implementation, but this is the one side, the British side, literally has not done the things that it said that it would have done by this point in time. Is that correct? correct. Yes. And, and, um, and, and now we need to discuss with the UK how, how the UK has a plan to, to, make it, to make it happen and to make sure implementation of the protocol fully happens. I mean, the, this is part of legally binding obligations that we undertook towards each other. Uh, in the withdrawal agreement that was ratified by the House of Commons after the, after the elections that brought Prime Minister Johnson in December 19 uh, back into power, or well, not back, but kept him into power. He was prime minister before. So this is part of what we have agreed. Uh, and I think both the UK and the EU, we, we have a responsibility there in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process. And I think no one has an interest to, to reopen issues that were agreed. It's, it's about implementation. And the other thing I would say to that is when this deal was announced and when the UK government also welcomed this deal, some people stressed also members of the UK government that this was the best of both worlds for Northern Ireland. And I think we need to, we, we can't forget that. I mean, that's something that Northern Ireland can also see as an opportunity for its own, for its own development. I mean, Northern Ireland, um, in terms of its economic development on average, is not, um, is not in the best performance of the UK entities, obviously. And so there is um, catch up work that, that would be very welcome there. And in that sense, I think it is very important that we keep the stability and, and the certainty that the protocol creates. Everybody knows what is the system that must apply. And now the question is, how do we make it happen? How do we make it apply fully? Um, I mean, you're a, you're a negotiator. Do you trust the people that you're negotiating with now? Well, we're not negotiating. Do you trust the people that you're still dealing with on a day to day basis? <laughs> well, we are in the implementation phase. And I think we're working constructively. So in that sense, we, we need to focus on that. We, with Michael Gove and, and his team, uh, and the people who are on the UK administration, we, we are working constructively uh, with the people. And so we need to keep doing that. Can, I, can we turn to financial services? Yvonne, Yvonne mentioned this in her introduction. And um, I mean, financial services, the great mystery, maybe it's not really a mystery, but the, the, the great loose end dangling after after last year's negotiations this financial services huge employer a million people or so in the uk compared with about twelve thousand people who work in fisheries and yet all we heard about towards the end of the negotiations was fisheries um and it's crazy because you know mr barnier who, who of course you work with uh, the chief negotiator as a former financial services commissioner you headed the unit um overseeing free movement of capital. There is a lot of expertise in that room on financial services, and yet we uh, ha have almost nothing on that. Why, why is that? I mean, just explain to us why, why it makes sense that financial services is not a more central part of that agreement. Well, it's a, it is indeed a fascinating outcome in a way. It's not, I think on, on the EU side, if you would give us, put us in a time machine back into, end of 16, early 17, we would certainly have expected a different ask from the, from the UK side on this. On our side, I think it was always clear as soon as the UK said we are leaving the single market, what the consequences of that would be. So we have not shifted our position. If you would even look back at what Michel Barnier said in 2017, the outcome in December 2020 dovetails very nicely with things he said already in, in June, July 17. So in that sense, on our side, there's no surprise there. One could, of course, express surprise at the fact that the UK did not ask for more. The UK tried under the Theresa May government to 
say let's create a system of kind of joint equivalence assessments or joint if assessment if, if the equivalence which is the EU's regime for those of that that basically gives market access to third countries in a much more smoother way that, than regular third country market access by declaring the regulatory and the supervisory regime of the UK in this particular case equivalent for instance on clearing or trading venues or investment firms so so that the UK at some point said well let's let's have a joint mechanism on that of if the EU withdraws equivalence you need to have a voice in that or gives it and we resisted that and said well that is basically part of the EU's autonomy and if you're leaving the EU you have no voice in, in those issues and at some point the UK accepted that and so the the outcome is indeed quite remarkable now how is it remarkable though and that is the interesting question it's remarkable compared to EU membership of course and it's a drastic change compared to EU membership where you have the passport um, that, that allows you to circulate with financial services in, in a single market from London or from other places in the UK it's not so remarkable if you compare to what we have with Japan or Canada or other third countries around the world and so if the benchmark is the UK decided to become a third country out of the single market it's not so remarkable what the what the agreement has because the agreement give, gives a number of clauses which we which we have with third countries about non-discrimination of UK operators who want to establish themselves in the single market so inside the EU but doesn't give the possibility uh, which is very different from the single market doesn't give the possibility to offer services on a cross-border basis supplied from from within the UK and that's because of financial stability consumer protection investor protection um, the different regulatory objectives that, uh, regu that financial regulation has so well yes it is it is where we are and uh, it's, a, it's a radical change compared to the single market that existed before what you have seen is a relocation of a number of activities from the UK to, to the EU fair trading uh, asset management uh, insurance they banks they applied for licenses or regulatory permits in in the EU countries in Frankfurt Paris Amsterdam Dublin Brussels different places um, and that's basically the the single market chunk of the city which um, that serves the single market that has basically moved this doesn't I mean for me this is just a challenge for the city and I'm sure the city with London will remain a global financial center it will just be somewhat different in terms of serving the, the EU and it's also an opportunity for the EU to develop further its capital markets union uh, and its single market for financial services more more broadly I think as we've seen some of that uh, there's some data out today on um, euro euro, denom euro denominated swaps that have, where activity which is a huge market and activities moved away from Britain quite decisively this year but it hasn't all moved to Europe right so Europe I think Europe's share of that business went from 10% to 25%, but the US share of that business also went up from 10% to 20%. So, so Europe has gained, the UK has lost, but the US has also gained. So you, what you've ended up with is kind of fragmentation. Do you, does, that, does that concern you? And are you worried about being more dependent on US financial institutions, which already dominate, certainly in terms of corporate finance, M&A, trading, you know, the US banks have been eating the European banks breakfast for many years and it looks like that's now going to get more pronounced is that a is that a risk that's uh, you know high up on your well, list of things to address but I mean the fragmentation is, is, is a consequence of the UK's choice and then the challenge for the EU is to is to develop its own banking union further its capital markets union its single market for for financial services that some of the activities from the UK have moved to New York. Okay, that's that's a regulatory decision, that's a, or a business decision based on the new regulatory framework that Brexit created and that the trade and cooperation agreement created. So there was quite a bit of pressure from industry to grant equivalences, or we kind of looked at that in a way that you know we need to further assess the UK's regime. And if you look at what happened between December and January, there was indeed a shift share trading derivative trading of issues and um, so that's basically the the other example was the, the ETS uh, the intercontinental exchange announced uh, to its clients that it will also move a number of its operations to to the single market rather than keep them in in, in London in terms of emissions trading 
So all that is part of a natural business adjustment to, to the new regulatory environment that Brexit plus the trade and cooperation agreement created. I guess because there are two sides to it though, right? One is that, and you're you're too polite to say it in this way, so I'm, I don't mean to put words into your mouth, but there's a kind of you broke it, you pay for it thing here, which is that Britain, you know, Britain has got what it asked for and what it asked for turns out to be not much fun because a lot of that activity is, is already leaving Britain and going elsewhere. And that's, you know, that's fairly clear. But I guess if, if one, one consequence of that is that the US becomes stronger too, is that good for Europe? Because you have to consider both what's fair between the UK and the, and the EU, but also what's in the net best interests of, of Europe. And I just wonder if a, a larger uh, US presence in some of your markets is in keeping with that. Well, we remain an open market in terms of the, I mean, you refer to the fact that I was in charge of free movement of capital. We, even in our treaty, this is an open, open capital market. And so, uh, and, and we have an extra third country, unfortunately, because Brexit is not exactly the, yeah, the, the, the biggest fun story of my EU career so far, but right. it's what we had to do. And that's just the reality of, of the, that's just a new reality. I mean, we, we can regret that, we can deplore the negative consequences, we just have to get on with it. And, and, and well, but you don't, have, you don't just have to get on with it, do you? Because the, we then get to the question of equivalence, which is obviously not the same as what happened, what we had before, this passporting the British firms enjoyed before, but it is, it's a gift that the EU can give that says, we will treat your institutions as being regulated just as safely and soundly as ours are, and they can do a lot more than they would be able to just as a pure third country. So. Let, let's talk a bit about the equivalence because as, as some of the audience may have seen, Andrew Bailey, who's the governor of the Bank of England, is quite um, agitated about the, some of the uh, details of the equivalence uh, process, if you like. He's, he said on Monday uh, that the EU seems to be asking for, um, for something that it itself would never agree to, which is basically a pledge not to change regulation on the financial service industry, or possibly not to change it unless Europe does. Is he right to say that, that this that you're asking for something that you would never yourself agree to? I'm not saying that, it, that there's any reason, I'm not saying that would be a bad thing, I'm just asking mm. if he's correct. Well, we are in the process of assessing equivalence of, of a wide range of issues related to financial markets and, and financial services. Uh, and that process is ongoing. We, so I don't really want to get dragged into a discussion whether whether Mr. Bailey, uh, I mean, he, he of course stands up for, for the UK's interests in this, that, that's quite natural. And we will defend the interests of the EU. And one important element in that is of course how close the UK is interwoven for the moment and, and for the future with, with, with the economies of the EU and of the EU. And so in terms of equivalence and potential implications for financial stability, one has to take that into account when uh, when assessing equivalence uh, decisions. For the moment, we have one in place, or two rather, but one Im more important one, which is the CCPs, the Central Clearing Parties. And part of that decision that the Commission took in, uh, in September is also very clearly framed as working with the industry to reduce that exposure to UK infrastructure, um, and indeed to reduce that EU CCP exposure to the UK and build up capacity inside inside the EU. So if you're, of course, from the UK's perspective, that's maybe not something that, that you want to see happen, but that's basically, from the EU's perspective, something that we advocate and that we want to work on also and have invited the industry to in the, on the EU side to work on that, to build up that capacity in terms of European Union banks or the banks from the member states, or EU, EU banks, I mean, um, adjusting to that situation. And, so, but as of now, we are in a situation where we have very little in terms of equivalence and the assessment of the equivalence is, uh, is ongoing. What is, what's in that assessment? Like what's, what's the, I know it's a unilateral process, of course, the, the, the EU is under no obligation whatsoever to give it or to give it on the same terms to different countries. What, but what, what, is, what, what, do, you, what do you ask? Do you, is there a clear sense of what one has to do to merit equivalence in this? Context. Well, that's partly defined in the regulations, so, and, and it depends a bit on which 
issue we're talking about, if you talk about trading venues or investment firms, or you talk about um, certain requirements for capital and banks, it depends a bit on what kind of equivalents one talks about. Some are about giving market access to third country operators, and obviously there, there's a very stringent equivalence assessment process. Um, others are more about facilitating the life of EU operators working in the UK in terms of capital requirements or, or, or different other issues. So it depends a bit on what kind of assessment, what kind of equivalences one talks about. And, but you're right to point out that one thing is the assessment of the regulatory supervisory regime and the quality of that. The other issue could be conditions that then the EU puts in an equivalence decision, much like we did with the US when we had the, uh, on the derivatives and the swaps, as they called in the US. We, there were stringent conditions that were put in there on the EU side at the time. That's can be part of a process on the EU in terms of granting equivalent subject to the third country respecting a number of conditions. Uh, and then, of course, it's also an, uh, ultimately an autonomous decision of the EU to grant equivalents or not, as you said. And is, it, is, there any, is it right to think that there's no requirement for the terms to be the same from one country to another? Because that's the other thing that the Bank of England governor had mentioned. He said, he's oversimplifying, but he said, you know, Canada and, you know, you've done it for Canada and the US. Why, why not us? Um, I wonder if that's a, if that kind of overstates the extent to which these things have a template that are all and are all similar. But it is a process which is subject to, to due process and to how the regulations define it and to certain procedures on the EU side. And it's all subject also to jurisdictional or jurisprudential control, so to say. So this is a structured process that, that, that takes its course. OK, and what I have one other thing to ask you on, on the equivalence issue, which is when safety is obviously a priority, safety of the financial system, and, and the financial crisis is still a fairly recent memory, um, it's, it's understandable to not want regulation to be weakened on one side. To what extent are there also competition, competitive uh, considerations in that equivalence um, process? In other words, um, is, does the EU also consider, is it in our competitive interest to allow equivalence in any given area? Yeah, well, and the, and the regulatory interest, of course, and, the, but, and the financial stability interest, uh, I guess you call safety in your question, which is an overriding concern. You rightly refer to the financial crisis and we had so many crises in between that you almost would forget it sometimes. But it's only 12, 10 years ago that we had the financial crisis and, and the whole regulatory Reno renewal that happened on the EU side and on the US side as well um, after that. Um, I lost track of your question now, sorry. So I'm saying, I'm saying, can you, like, it's all right saying, you know, it, we don't grant equivalence unless we know that a country is, it has a good regulatory regime. Is For it sure. also a consideration of, we're not going to grant you equivalence because we'd like our banks to grow faster than your, your banks in our own countries, for example? Well, certainly it is part of a policy where we want to develop uh, further the capital markets union, and the banking union that I referred to earlier. So that is, it's part of a toolbox that the EU uses, of course, in its own interest. That, that's absolutely clear. But then to come back to the earlier point, it is also in our interest to be an open market in terms of attracting capital. And so that's also part of how the EU functions. One should not you know, present this as the EU shielding itself and, and it, it, the, EU, the EU is committed to remain an open financial market um, that works well with third countries around the world. And uh, that, that will not change because of Brexit, obviously. It will just, the issue, in, particularly with the UK, is given its proximity and, and the history also as an, as an ex-member now, um, the potential repercussions on financial stability are, of course, very different. Um, with the UK compared to, let's say, uh, South Africa or Japan or other countries around the world with whom the, the, the flows are, are much less. And so that, that, that's also an important, almost sui generis issue for the UK to keep into consideration for the EU when, when assessing the equivalents. But more broadly, and I think that's then also in financial services, but beyond it, you refer to competition in your question. I think one natural consequence of Brexit is there will be more policy competition and more regulatory competition between the UK and the EU. That's as such can may not be a bad thing. 
It just will be framed though by this trade and cooperation agreement, where we have agreed to a number of standards in terms of divergence from those standards and possibilities for the other party, the UK or the EU, to act. So that policy competition is well governed, so to say, by the trade and cooperation agreement. And so if you come to financial services, we come back to that. If you talk about state aid on our side or subsidies on the, on the UK side, as it's called now in the agreement, then of course we have mechanisms there in terms of support for banks from the state to make sure that this happens in a way which is open and fair and doesn't distort competition between us. But that goes then beyond the equivalence and then we're back into the, the, the toolbox of the trade and cooperation agreement. So I'm sure you're raring to get cracking on another complicated trade negotiation. Um, how, what if, what if any impact does Brexit have on other kinds of trade deal that, that Europe could become involved with? So, for example, um, we've, we've got an audience member asking about the, um, about TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, with the US. Does, it, do, do the, does the possibility of doing those kind of deals change at all now that Britain is no longer part of the European Union? Or does well, the prioritization of those things change? The UK will no longer have a voice in, in that trade policy, obviously, of, of the European Union. Um, will that mean a change? I mean, we need to, we are discussing or negotiating with different countries, New Zealand, Australia, uh, as far as the US is concerned, let, let's see how, how that develops with the new administration as well. Um, what I would note is, of course, we have now a novel free trade agreement with level playing fields, commitments that, uh, that you cannot find in any of the other free trade agreements that, uh, that the European Union has. And I would stress to that, of course, this is important, but the UK is so close to us and is so interwoven uh, as an ex-member, but also due to its geographical proximity and, and the gravity of trade and the fact that distance still matters a lot in trade, in particular in goods, that these are probably level playing field commitments which are typical for this agreement. Uh, there are, of course, some voices in here in Brussels talking about this now, but every free trade agreement is tailor-made to the country with, uh, with whom one negotiates. And so, um, now, will the trade policy change because the UK is gone? It's up to the, the Commission, the 27 countries. I mean, that's not... So that's, that is shaped by, by, the, by the EU countries, by the European Commission, by what the European Parliament wants. And the only thing we can say at this stage in terms of the UK is that, well, it lost its voice in that, it's lost its influence in that. And it can only influence it from the outside, but no longer from the inside. And that's, that's a big, big difference, of course. Got it. Oh, just another question on, on, from, from an audience member. Are you seeing, or do you expect to see, more importantly, are you seeing evidence that, that small, smaller UK, UK companies, businesses are actually moving or trying to move to Europe? We know about the financial sector shifting assets for various reasons, um, but what about you know, you know, Main Street, if you like, businesses? Are you seeing much transfer of activity? Yeah, we, we see indeed. We are we're not monitoring that systematically, just to be clear. I mean, we are of course on the regulatory side. We create the framework for for business decisions, and it's up to the businesses to decide what is commercially viable and and, and what not. But we indeed see through through reports we have and through our our, our colleagues in the London delegation and, uh, and various monitoring mechanisms that this is indeed happening. Some UK businesses have stopped exporting uh, to the EU. Uh, some EU logistics companies are a little bit more wary about serving the UK market because they need to adjust uh, the calculations in that in terms of coming back empty or not. And so there is, for the moment, of course, COVID also plays, and the pandemic plays, plays a very important role in that. But we have seen, we discussed financial services, indeed important shifts there in terms of assets as well as people and personnel, as a staff of the financial institutions. We have seen um, a number of um, UK operations establishing uh, in different European countries or reinforcing their European operation or shifting part of their distribution or supply operation to, to the EU and to different EU countries. That's just a natural phenomenon, I think. That's part of the lost output of the UK economy that uh, the Commission again confirmed today in its, in its forecast. Are you, are you concerned at all that 
the, those those kind of flows which are perfectly logical as you say will even though they are perfectly logical will just increase the tensions between on, on the relationship because a lot of the a lot of the relationship especially the northern Ireland protocol depends on as you say having a positive cooperating environment and there, there is a there is a sort of inherent conflict here between being peers and collaborators and being competitors and it and it's very difficult to articulate the full extent to which com competition is going to be a in some ways it's going to look like a zero-sum game so so how does that how is the relationship going to withstand those the inevitable brain and capital drain that now happens as companies financial services companies people try and move to the eu and leave britain in the short term worse off right i mean i'm not sure if this will create more more tensions i mean on our side this is something we have always been very transparent about that this was a natural consequence and a mechanical consequence of the uk leaving the single market and the customs union so we have been saying this for for a number of years um, the political discourse from some people in the uk has tried to minimize or trivialize a bit of these negative consequences um, so maybe there is some scope for tension there i don't know that's really something for for the uk uh, and not for, for people on the EU side to work. But I think more broadly, the risk is there in terms of uh, the implementation of this agreement and more broadly, and, and we should manage that risk and avoid it and create a very positive cooperation agenda. Why do I say the risk is there? Because if you look at the level playing field commitments of a trade and cooperation agreement, there's of course a risk for use of remedial measures, rebalancing measures, compensatory measures, suspending obligations or benefits, uh, reintroducing tariffs, that's part of the toolbox that has been agreed. And it comes back to the question of, well, the, once the UK is outside of the ecosystem of the single market, how do we trade? And, and how do we make sure that commitments are, are respected? And let's hope we don't have to use that and we can actually construct indeed a more positive agenda cooperation both for the implementation of the, the trade and cooperation agreement and then more broadly and there i think i would open it up to issues beyond the trade and cooperation agreement and beyond the irish and northern irish protocol we have climate change in 20, 2021 the cop 26 at the uk is organizing where with the biden administration now back on board for the paris agreement i think there is a lot of scope there for the uk and the eu also for the US and the EU to cooperate. But if we bring it back to the UK EU discussion, there is a lot of scope there for a positive agenda on other global issues such as biodiversity, even on financial services, or but not even, but also on financial services, I should say, where we discussed a bit of the tension and the equivalence issues right now. But if you look at the G20 and the global processes there, we should find a way to cooperate with as EU with the UK um, in terms of the global agenda. And, uh, and, and how to influence that. So we need to look at the broader picture. There are lots of challenges coming to us also from other um, situations in on the European continent where a strong cooperation between the UK and the EU on foreign policy security issues will also be very beneficial, I think, for, for a positive cooperation agenda. How, uh, on, you mentioned, you mentioned um, some of the environmental issues. Um, how one one thing that's already been raised is, is the impact of the, the carbon border adjustment um, that Europe is considering, whereby imports from countries can be can face a tariff based on the implied carbon intensity of those products. Um, mm -hmm. And one risk is that that creates potentially tariffs on British products coming into Northern Ireland, because that's where the border is, and you have to impose it somewhere if you're going to impose it at all. How it seems to me that that's a that's a potential crisis in the making. How are you thinking about that, and should and and are you thinking about that at this early stage? Well, both the UK and the EU are committed to climate neutrality and to very ambitious targets there over the over the years and decades to come. So, in that sense, we have a fertile ground for good cooperation there, which will also reinforced through this trade and cooperation agreement where we, for instance, say that we would consider linking the, the new UK system on emissions trading with the, with the EU's emissions trading system. So there are 
positive agendas there for cooperation, I think, that we should exploit. Um, Does it come down to a kind of equivalent style arrangement? Well, it, it is certainly subject to conditions because I mean, we need to discuss that and it wasn't easy always during the negotiations in terms of the scope of that ETS, uh, so sectorial scope as well, the effectiveness of the ETS mechanism. On the EU side, there is an added issue there that there is a kind of a solidarity component in terms of redistribution between member states in terms of carbon and member states with their different stages of, of their economic development also have different capacities, different needs. So it is technically, it can be a complicated discussion. I think politically, we certainly have a, an interest there, given the objective on both sides for climate neutrality and, and CO2 uh, to work together. But again, the EU will develop its own policy and the UK has lost its voice in, in that policy. So it will be a different style, a different kind of cooperation compared to, compared to when the UK was a member, obviously. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I have to ask you also about Scotland. That's because you know the title of this session is "What's Next," and one of the things that is next is that Scotland is going to have elections, and it's looking increasingly like Scotland is going to ask for a referendum on potentially separating from the UK. So, and and if that happens, and there are many ifs there, but one of the first things they'll presumably want to do is enter the European Union, um, which they'd probably do with a gigantic budget deficit. So what kind of reception would would an independent Scotland get? And 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 is there a is there a sort of what what does the Brexit process tell us about how the admission of a new country, say Scotland, might work? Well, I may disappoint you a little bit there because we have of course met Nicola Sturgeon many times during during these negotiations also with Michel Barnier to discuss the issues, but we always made very clear we're discussing and negotiating with the UK government. We're always happy to listen to the devolved entities, just like Michel Barnier met the Labour Party on different occasions and different other political leaders from the UK. But your question is more one that, your question is one that only the UK can solve. It's not something that the European Union has a particular role to play in. Uh, there are elections in Scotland, as you say, there may be a request for a referendum, but that's then something which must be managed within the UK. This is not something for the European Union to, to get involved in. It's a, it's a purely right. an internal UK matter. Right. Well, that's you sort of sidestepping the question there a little bit, right? Because the, the, definitely that's true with the referendum itself. But I guess what I'm saying is, is there scope for fast tracking a country that was formerly in some sense part of the EU coming back into the EU as an independent country? Look, the UK is a third country, whether Scotland has another referendum, doesn't that's really up to the UK to to manage that and to decide on that. Okay, um, I, just to sort of round out, um, I mean, this is basically, I think that Mr. Barnier said many times that this was a divorce um, and it was a divorce, right? I mean, a divorce is always kind of sad. It's a sign that, you know, marriage didn't work out despite lots of hard work from both sides. So it's hard to be, whatever you think, it's hard really to be happy about this. Although, you know, the, the achievement of drawing up the TCA is, is, is a formidable one, but what good um, comes from this? Is that, do you, see, do you see any specific opportunities arising out of Brexit for the European side? No, not really. I, um, as you say, it's a sad story. It's, a, it's an important economy on the European continent. It's a veto member of the UN Security Council. It's a G7 country. Uh, it's a country with a global remit and a global influence. So it is sad to have seen the country leave, but that's just the way it is. I mean, as you say, for lucky we have an agreement, uh, and it can. It is certainly not a, as beneficial as as EU membership, and that's just the way it is now. And now we need to make the new situation work. I mean, we all need to adjust to that. I hardly see benefits for the European Union uh, in this story, neither for. For the European continent as a whole, so to say, but that's just what, what we have to manage now and how we have to deal with UK. Even though, even though we've seen financial activities moving to Europe, small businesses are trying to move to Europe. Um, you still don't see any benefit for the European Union in this. Well, 
if you have a single market of financial services, obviously the UK has has benefited tremendously from that, and, and, and so it's a natural consequence of leaving that. Then you see certain financial centres of a much smaller size, and on the EU side, getting extra activities. It's much more dispersed. It's much more decentralised compared to compared to well, it, it leaves one place basically, London and the city, to go to five, six, seven places on on the European continent, and that's just a business decision from the new framework that, that was created. So, of course, you can say, yeah, that's nice, and, and, and a number of member states, no doubt, find that rather pleasant, and there was all kind of red carpet and uh, different cities also having campaigns to attract uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Remember the two agencies that left London at some point, the Medicines Agency and the Banking Authority, there was a race from all member states in Italy to, to get one of the two. and. Uh, Mm -hmm. Is that beneficial? Yeah, it's nice, of course, that uh, the medicines agency is now in Amsterdam. That's nice for the Dutch. Mm -hmm. but that's not the reason to do Brexit, obviously. Got it. Okay, super, super quick last question before I hand back to Yvonne. Um, now that now that many of the institutions with which you deal don't have as many British people in them, a lot of, a lot of the kind of civil servants have obviously moved elsewhere, if not physically, then they're no longer part of that discussion. Does it feel any different? Well, many British colleagues have stayed. Huh? Some have become Belgian. Mm -hmm. Some have taken on other nationalities, uh, depending on who their marriage or their grandmother being Irish or something. So, um, so the, the and we took a decision that the British civil servants can stay in the European Commission. Uh, as President Juncker once said, they left their nationality at the door. But yes, it's of course the recruitment of British young Brits is no longer something that we do, and uh, that will lead to changes. Michelle Barney got a question this morning whether it will change linguistically. I think we will continue speaking English, but maybe some other languages can also make little progress as well in this new environment. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's been really great talking to you. You've been very generous with your time and your insights. Um, I'll now hand back to Yvonne. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, interesting, interesting discussion. Thank you so much for joining me. I think my takeaway is um, let's try to get beyond Brexit, to iron out the kinks and start dealing with bigger issues. And I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiment. It's just sad to, to see Britain go. But um, I know it's neither here nor there. I, in my heart, hope that on a personal level, it has nothing to do with, with my role at EACC, hope that we will find back together again. I know that people who get a divorce very, very rarely remarry, but at a personal level, I hope we will remarry. So, uh, um, you know, <laughs> the end, um, hope springs eternal, I guess. But um, thank you again um, to, to, to both of you, uh, um, Stefan, for taking the time and um, John for, for uh, um, excellent um, questions um, throughout, the, throughout the conversation. And um, this concludes today's webinar. It won't be the last discussion that we have around Brexit because there's obviously a lot um, to talk about now. And um, we will um, do a number of programs, so be sure to follow um, our announcements. There will be more to come on Brexit um, on a variety of levels. We also have launched a uh, um, initiative beyond Brexit with um, its podcasts, um, thought leadership articles, and um, other Brexit-related issues to help you navigate the new, uh, um, the new environment. And a quick reminder, if you are a member of the EACC and you would like to connect to anyone who also attended this program, do reach out to us. We're happy to connect you. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.